Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Appraisal Buzzcast. We've got a great episode for you. We have a returning guest, but first, let's bring in Hal. Hal, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you, Jim? <laughs> I'm doing great. We have Peter Christensen back. It's been a while since we've talked to him. I'm so excited to get a chance to talk with him again. Peter, good to have you here. Hey, Hal, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Um, we've got uh, what, what I think is a fun show today. Jim, do you mind to kind of just give us an overview of what we're going to be doing today? Yeah, we're going to be talking about a couple different topics. We're going to touch on some of the appraisal liability stuff, but really, Peter has a very interesting story that he's going to share with us about what it is for new appraisers getting into the industry. So I'll let you guys get into that. That sounds good. Um, so for our listeners, I am absolutely tickled to have Peter in the room today. Peter is uh, one of the most thoughtful um, and discerning presenters I've ever seen in the appraisal industry. He does a really good job of presenting courses and talking about difficult topics. Peter, just, you know, I know everybody in the room probably knows you, um, but give me a little bit of history about you and the appraisal business. How did you get wrapped up in this appraisal stuff? I got wrapped up into the appraisal stuff. Well, first of all, I'm not an appraiser. I've just been <clears throat> around appraisal issues, legal issues for now about 20 years. And that's because um, I went to work for an E&O company uh, that at that time insured about 15,000 appraisers. And wow. um, I was kind of the in-house lawyer at the E&O company. And I spent about a dozen years doing that, hearing from appraisers about thousands of claims, thousands of disciplinary matters. And then I kind of felt like I was outgrowing that space of just hearing the liability side. I had a lot of uh, people asking me, could I help them with this? Could I help them with like engagement agreements for assignments or commercial firms had questions about getting set up? A, this was around 2009, so AMCs had questions about getting set up. Can we do this or that? How do we do it? And so I kind of branched out and started doing legal work beyond just E&O issues in okay. relation to valuation. And so then finally in 2019, I wrapped up my work with the E&O side and just went out on my own full time as a lawyer, um, always focused on valuation issues. And so that's what I've been doing. Uh, completely for the last uh, four years on my own, separate from the you know company. You know, it, it occurs to me for an attorney, um, there's an old joke in the appraisal profession. Why do people become appraisers? Because they don't have enough personality to be accountants. Um, for an attorney, it might seem like a mind-numbingly boring area of, of, of legal study, but watching you work and watching some of the, the, the cases coming down the pike for appraisers, I think it's pretty interesting. Well, yeah, when you have, a, well, first of all, the E&O cases could get very interesting. I, um, you know, I had appraisers call me from jail. I was their first, con their fir first phone call was, hey, I'm going to call my E&O company. I've just been charged with a crime. Oh, no. uh, so, you know, even on the E&O side, there was always something interesting happening. But when, as I do, I have about 40 or 50 active, very large appraisal firms and AMCs that I work for, I think some of the most interesting problems filtered down to me. Uh, so it could be, um, what do we do? Someone just pulled a gun on our appraiser. Mm -hmm. uh, what do we need to do as an AMC or as an appraisal firm? That happened just the other day. Oh, wow. Um, it could be uh, we've had a, an appraiser hurt out in the field. How do we respond to that? Or it could be something more fascinating like um, how do we do an evaluation in all 50 states? Um, you know, what's the legality of an evaluation? Do you need a, a, a licensed appraiser to do it? So those are the kinds of, like, for me, it is interesting. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, 
I I've talked to you on a couple of occasions about specific cases and, and I always find them interesting because I come at it from a, an investigator's point of view, but I think for a lawyer that, that, that has the brain to get into, um, the appraisal world, it's an interesting place. Let's take a quick break and give a shout out to one of our sponsors and then I'll be back and we'll finish up our conversation with Peter Christensen. The Appraisal Institute recently launched its Instagram page, AI's latest presence on social media joining Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube and the Face Value podcast. Visit and follow AI's Instagram page for another way to access valuation news and association updates. www.instagram.com slash appraisal institute. I'm Hal Humphreys. You're listening to the Appraisal Buzz. I'm joined today by Peter, Chris, Peter Christensen. Um, you know, we just heard from the Appraisal Institute. Peter, you've been in and around this business for quite some time. Um, anything interesting going on in your life um, re revolving around the appraisal industry? Well, in my life, I don't know if this was a bad life choice or not, but <laughs> after uh, 15 years or so of being around appraisers, 20 years of being around appraisers, handling their legal issues. Like I, I thought, well, gee, maybe I should get an appraiser license. And so I, I started taking the qualifying education that appraisers need to take. And I'm, uh, it's more out of curiosity for what it is, the education that they have to take. And, um, and then, and, and that, ha I know you, you just did a commercial about the appraisal Institute. My qualifying education happens to be with the appraisal Institute. Yeah. And, and it's, it's not that I want to be an appraiser, but I was curious and I wouldn't have the plan of actually getting a supervisor to do the experience required, uh, as, uh, as a trainee would typically need. So I'm hoping that a Perea program comes out sometime this year. And I would plan to try that out of curiosity. So that brings us to naturally to our next topic, which is Perea. There's a lot of um, word on the street and good information and flawed information rolling around in the appraisal world about Perea, what it means for appraisers. You know, from the appraiser perspective, some appraisers are like, I went through this whole process. I think everybody else ought to have to go through it. Almost like they went through a hazing ritual by working for a mentor and they think everybody else should have to do that. Um, tell me your thoughts on, on the viability of Perea as a way to um, get new people into the business without so many barriers to entry. Um, well, I'm hoping, I mean, I think part of the problem is no one's seen a Perea, right? No one's right. seen a Perea program. So except for the course designers, we're all wondering what's going to be in it. How can it, how could it actually get me educated enough to do appraisals out in the field? Right. So I'm, I'm curious about it. Uh, but the supervisor system hasn't always worked so perfectly either, which makes me think of an appraiser, um, who's not, who's not that experienced appraiser. He's still pretty young, but he was telling me about how his supervisor trained him to do the neighborhood description in 1004 appraisal reports. And uh, the way he was trained was, here's your neighborhood description. This description will work for every appraisal you ever do in this part of the state. And it was, it's a big state and it's a big geographic area. It was perfectly written to say something like the subject property is proximate to schools and job centers and <laughs> near reasonable transportation. So there might be, I'm, I don't know, I might learn a different way in, in my Perea uh, program, I hope. Uh, I wouldn't say that that's true for, you know, that kind of lack of education would be true for all supervisors, of course. But I think what right. we can hope for is some more consistency, at least. Uh, yeah, like a there consistent was bar of some sort to it yeah there, there was a time in the legal world where you know you would get your law license by apprenticing for a number of years now that that has long since gone away um, but for an attorney uh, you go to law school you graduate law school you pass the bar and then you are allowed to practice law now you have to consider your own competency 
Um, and you know, I've heard some of my lawyer friends talk about it in terms of, you know, it's kind of like a pilot's license. It's a license to learn. Um, I think, you know, there are way too many barriers to entry into the appraisal profession. And I think Perea is an interesting, um, and, and pretty well thought out idea. What are regulators thinking of Perea in general? I know some states have tried to, to block it entirely. What, what are you seeing on the regulator side? Well, I think, um, even the states that might've been looking at blocking it initially with a couple of exceptions, um, are coming around to needing to accept it right. um, for the reason that you brought up a barrier to entry. Uh, because if you're one of those states that isn't going to accept Perea, you, you are putting yourself in jeopardy of, of being accused um, of limiting access to the profession. And people would say, fair housing organizations, civil rights organizations would say that if you don't have Perea in your state, you're limiting access to the profession to people of color or other people who have a hard time gaining entry into the pref profession. So that's a real risk to right. regulators to put up a, a roadblock to it. But the other struggles that some, that I think for most states are working on is they haven't seen Perea either yet. And so while they have accepted it and they'll say that Perea will count towards getting a licensed or certified residential credential, um, nobody's not quite sure how yet, because if you are a person taking per, like your qualifying education and then you're planning to do Perea, you probably never register as a trainee because you'll never have a supervisor. And so some states haven't contemplated that. So who are the people out there, the states don't know, doing qualifying education who are planning to do Perea at some right. point? It's a, it's a very foreign system and it's gonna take a couple of years of adjusting at the states. Yeah, cause I think the regulators are used to seeing, you know, oh, you're, you're a trainee and a trainee must have a supervisor. Um, but now there's this option of, oh, you're, a, you're coming through Perea, who's your mentor? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think that the first time that like, if I followed through on doing Priya and getting a license, I think the first time I would ever contact my state is when I want to take that exam. They would wow. never, I don't think they would have ever heard from me until that point in time. I would never register as a trainee. Uh, so right. there's just going to be some adjusting in the States around that. Interesting. All right. Well, I think that's, um, that's a good kind of overview of some of the interesting points and potential problems with Perea. Let's take another quick break to give a shout out to another one of our sponsors. Since 1978, LIA Administrators and Insurance Services has been offering E&O insurance to valuation professionals. LIA applies superior customer service, exceptional liability education from Peter Christensen, and unparalleled claim defense managed by Claudia Gaglioni. LIA offers errors and omissions, commercial bonds, general liability, cyber liability, and real estate agents and brokers E&O. Visit liability.com or call 800-334-0652. Welcome back, everybody. Hal Humphreys, you're listening to Buzzcast. I'm talking to Peter Christensen today. Peter, um, you know, we, we've kind of talked about Perea a little bit and, and what it might mean for appraisers. Um, before we move on to the topic of current lawsuits, I, you know, this is just literally Hal being curious and, and, and making what I think is a decent point. Um, you know, attorneys go to law school, they learn the law. And in my experience, they focus on figuring out how the law applies to certain facts. I'm speaking specifically of trial lawyers. Um, how does the law apply to this fact pattern? Um, there is a huge space out there for real estate appraisers to offer consulting service to attorneys who are dealing with valuation issues because a lot of attorneys don't know anything about valuation issues. Um, I think the fact that you have been in and around the business for so long and now just, I think it seems like just out of intellectual curiosity, 
uh, you're going through the training that appraisers go through. Um, that puts you in a unique position. I, yeah, I, I, I suppose it does. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've, I've hired a lot of appraisers in my life, like as expert witnesses. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the frustrations that I can have of trying to work with appraisers sometimes, um, if it's not someone I've worked with before, is that sometimes that appraiser is just so keyed in on, I want to set, I want to give you or perform an appraisal for you. Uh, right. And that's not usually what I'm seeking initially when I reach out to an appraiser as an attorney. If I've got a case that I'm working on where I'm going to need an appraiser, could even be a case where I'm defending another appraiser in a professional liability or a disciplinary matter. The first thing I want is like an expert that I can talk to, like you were saying, that consulting. Like yeah. I just, I just want to learn about what are the real issues here? Like, I don't need an appraisal review. I just, I really want to get into a discussion of what did this appraiser really do wrong? Is it really meaningful or not? And just like, right. you know, have a frank discussion about it. Don't give me an appraisal review report. Let's just talk. And yeah. uh, so, I mean, that, you know, it's one of the things I've learned about working with appraisers over the years. Well, you know, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail and appraisers want to appraise. Um, but, uh, you know, in my experience, most of the attorneys I've worked with, what they want to know is, I mean, it's, it's the good fact, bad fact thing. They want to know the bad facts. Like they have to know the bad facts. They also want to know the good facts so that they can address both or use one or the other. Um, and a lot of times that has nothing to do with evaluation analysis or a review of someone's report. It has to do with what are appraisers usually supposed to do? How do most people handle this kind of thing? Just a consultation. So, um, but I think the fact that you're, you're, you're going through the education is, is, I don't know, I think it's commendable um, and, and fairly interesting. There are only a handful of lawyers I know that are anywhere near that position um, of understanding about the valuation profession. So, Thinking about lawsuits and defending appraisers, you know, I, I know appraisers are hyper aware these days of lawsuits. There's a lot of press on certain lawsuits around the country. Um, any specific uh, legal action that you can think of that might be of interest to our appraisers? Well, I hate to scare appraisers with all the, you know, like I do a lot of liability classes and I, and I don't like them all to be super scary. But I am seeing an uptick in litigation right now, a, a bit of an uptick. And one thing that I've been seeing is an increase in mortgage repurchases. So mm -hmm. someone like Fannie Mae forcing an originating lender to buy back a loan. The loan might not even be in default, um, but forcing the originating lender to buy back a loan because maybe there's an appraisal problem with it. Hmm. And so Fannie Mae will have had a review and then is forcing that originating lender to buy back the loan. And that's a real serious situation right now because that loan, say, may have been originated in 2020 mm -hmm. um, at a 3% interest rate, three-something interest rate. And now if that lender has to buy back that loan, that loan's going to be worth a lot less. Uh, and they're going to take a serious hit on that. So then what does the lender do? They turn around and they go after the appraiser or the AMC uh, over that mortgage repurchase for the loss that they've taken on having to buy back that loan. And so mm. I just saw a new lawsuit yesterday. This just sounds horrible. Um, Fannie Mae forced a lender to buy back a loan. Fannie Mae made a complaint to the state in which the appraiser was is located. Mm. Uh, so we've heard about there being many new Fannie Mae complaints to state boards across the country, and I've seen some evidence of that myself. So Fannie Mae made a complaint against the appraiser on its kind of like form lettery kind of complaint. Right. Uh, the state uh, did its investigation and actually cleared the appraiser, found no probable cause. Hmm. But the lender's still left with this buyback. They had to buy back the loan and they lost some serious money. What did the lender do? It sued the appraiser anyway. So the lender's suing the, the appraiser who, who doesn't even care what the state board said. And so, and not only they're suing the appraiser, but that lender happens to be located in New York. The appraiser is located in 
in a state that's about a thousand miles away. Oh no. So that lender is suing that appraiser, you know, in New York, a thousand miles from where the appraiser lives. This is some of the nightmare that uh, nightmares that I'm s starting to see pop up again. Oh my gosh. So, I mean, how do you deal with venue issues in a situation like that? Yeah. I mean, the obvious, the uh, appraiser of course reports the thing to the, the case to their ENO, but now the ENO has to get uh, a New York law firm to file a motion to protest saying that, no, this case really belongs in that other state, not in New York. Right. It's just, yeah, it's just a nightmare, but oh, I'm wow. seeing a few more of those nightmares now pop up. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, Peter, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to, to be with us today and, and share a little bit of your insight into this business. Um, and you know, here's the thing for our listeners out there. Um, the number of lawsuits may be ticking up a little bit, but look, most of us are not going to face a lawsuit in our lifetimes as an appraiser. Um, it's, it's a pretty safe business to be in. Um, especially if you approach the work in good faith and do really good work and, and, you know, cross your I's and dot your T's as they say, um, I think you're probably not likely to face a lawsuit, but if you do, First thing you get that registered letter in the mail, take a breath, calm down. It is not the end of the world. Talk to your ENO provider, talk to your attorney, um, and just walk through it in a systematic and, and thoughtful way. Um, Peter, any or other thoughts for folks that are going to have to deal with that stuff? What should they do first? Well, I mean, maybe <clears throat> you get that letter and you flee to Canada, Hal. <laughs> I mean, that's the question I pose in my classes and I've seen appraisers get served with that lawsuit and flee in one case to Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. He, the appraiser thought he'd hide out there for a while and let the thing blow over. No, mm. take the advice that Hal gave you and, you know, take that complaint. And I'll tell you, most appraisers who have a situation like that, the majority resolve with no monetary liability on the part of the appraiser regardless of whether it's covered by E&O. In most cases filed against appraisers, there ends up being no liability of the appraiser in the case. But as you said, Hal, it's, it's really true that most appraisers will go a career and never be sued over their work product. So that's why in my, in my classes, I just try to make it more about storytelling and let's, like, let's learn some interesting things about how we can improve the appraisal work just from the lawsuit. Let's not Let's not overly worry about getting sued. Let's just talk about what happened and how we might improve our own work. Yeah, I love it. Jim Morrison, you still with us, sir? Absolutely. Hey, Anything Peter, else? I was thinking about when you, uh, if you do become a licensed appraiser, would you be able to have, be your own expert witness in a <laughs> trial court? <laughs> no, that won't work out that well because it would it's awkward when uh you have to question yourself <laughs> yeah. as a witness yeah. but believe it or not i've tried cases where there was a party on the other side who did not have an attorney so oh. he had to get on the stand and the judge was making this party who was acting as his own attorney ask himself the questions and then give the answers and so this guy really took it to heart he would <laughs> use a different voice for the questions <laughs> And then he would face the other way and use it, you know, a different voice and different facial expressions for when he was the witness. Oh <laughs> so God. it, it doesn't work out that well because it makes you look crazy. <laughs> so there's, there's an old saying in the legal world, a lawyer who represents himself has a fool for a client. <laughs> well, yeah, mo yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Morrison, anything else we need to cover today? No, that's it. Thank you so much for joining us, Peter. It was a great conversation, and we're excited to see that about the travel that you get uh, up to Perea. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. And that is your appraisal buzz. I'm Hal Humphreys for Jim Morrison and Peter Christensen. We'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.